Welcome to Building the Future. I'm your host, Kevin Horick. You can check out the radio version of the show every Tuesdays and Thursdays at 2 p.m. Eastern on WDJY 99.1 in Atlanta. We also air on a podcasting network in Los Angeles called the 405 Media. There's a TV version of the show that airs on KMVT 15 in Silicon Valley at 8 p.m. Pacific on Tuesday nights. Both versions of the show air in other states. For these show times plus past episodes, please visit the show's website at buildingthefutureshow.com. The music for the show is done by Electric Mantra. You can check him out at electricmantra.com. Welcome back to the show. Today we have Neville Boston. He's the co-founder and CEO of Reviver Auto. Neville, welcome to the show. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Yeah, I'm excited to have you on the show. I, I think you guys are doing something in an industry that's, what, over 125 years old or, or was kind of created and now you guys are kind of modernizing it. But maybe before we kind of get into that fun stuff, let's get to know you a little bit better and start off with where you grew up. Okay, so uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go one step beyond that. So right. uh, my parents are both uh, from Guyana. It's the only English-speaking country in South America. So my dad immigrated to this country Wow. Uh, in uh, in the early 70s, and I was born in New York. Okay. So I've kind of lived this interesting you know, kind of immigrant experience. Even though I was born here, both of my parents immigrated to this country. Sure. Um, and then and then an interesting thing is that um, all of my dad's sisters and brothers have their own business of some kind. Interesting. So being entrepreneurial has been in my blood from the beginning. Sure. How many uh, brothers even my and grandfather sisters do you have? Sorry. My, my, um, I have uh, four sisters and brothers. Wow. I, you know, I was saying that all my father's uh, sisters and brothers have a business of some kind. Oh, so it's kind of inbred in us, like it's, you know, kind of part of our infrastructure. Yeah, DNA. <laughs> DNA, yes. No, that's really cool, man. So you went to university in California. How did you kind of make your, your way west and, and what got you passionate about taking what you took in university? Okay, so um, my my dad was a medical technologist, and my okay. uncle uh, had a, um, a lab here. So we actually moved west from from the East Coast to Bakersfield, California, of all places. Sure. Uh, and um, and I I kind of went to school there, and then I went from there to Cal, which okay. was just an amazing experience. Uh, I, I learned so much at the university and met some lifelong friends. But I studied poli sci because okay. I've always been kind of a, a political science nerd and business. Okay. So in a funny way, I'm doing exactly what my degree is in. Interesting. Oh, I think that's great, man. So you graduate university. Walk me through your career up until kind of what you're doing now and maybe some career highlights. Okay, so um, I I was getting ready to go to law school. I'd taken my LSATs and all of that. Okay. And I had a good friend approach me about a business. Uh, she had, had been in an advertising agency, and she wanted to open up her own firm. Okay. I had been working at a law firm and had brought some business in, so I actually had some additional capital to invest. So I went to my godfather in, in, in San Francisco, and I put the business plan in front of him. I was like, would you invest in this? And he was like, yes. So at that point, I realized this was a good business. So I, 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 I had my first uh, company. It was called Crosswalk. And we developed campaigns uh, for companies like, um, you know, Diageo and, um, and, um, and Moet Hennessy. And then I uh, worked with Microsoft and, and, uh, and Pepsi. So we had all this, these large clients that we, we did business for. Sure. Okay, so and then and then and then from there, um, I, I opened up another another firm that I invested in, and uh, one did uh, more FM uh, marketing, the other one did more general marketing, uh, and all of that was going swimmingly well until 2008, sure. uh, when there was a little you know uh, crack within the infrastructure of the planet, and yep. we had you know, all of these companies like falling apart. Uh, Pepsi lays off, you know, 5,000 people, Microsoft 3,000. So everything changed. And I had a, a good friend uh, that was in politics here in California. And I was telling him I wanted to get into, you know, a, a different kind of business, one that wasn't dependent on what the market was doing, a, a business that, that, you know, people 
had to have or had to do, you know, that was kind of, you know, insulated, you know, from changes within the economy. And we started looking at um, products and, 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 and properties that were owned by the state that were being underutilized. And a funny thing is that we kept coming back to the license plate. It hadn't been changed in over 100 years. And if you talk to anybody about their experience with, you know, DMV or something along those lines, it was always, you know, most times the negative one. Sure. So it was ripe for disruption. Okay. So how did you go from kind of making that or coming from like a, an idea into actually building a company that you co-founded and are now CEO of? To actually getting this thing like in a in physical kind of hands ready for cars. Okay, so the, the first thing I did is uh, my my good friend knew uh, the deputy director of legislation for the state of California. Okay, uh, for the so he got a meeting with him, and what I thought was going to be a five minute conversation ended up being an hour and a half conversation about the need for you know you know people to be able to go online and do registration. The ability to do it over air, where you didn't have to send, uh, you know, tags or stickers in the mail, and just to streamline a process that had been broken for a long time. And the next conversation we had was with his counterpart at the CHP, and we met with him and about 20 other CHP officers, and their feedback was really unique, and, and I think it really propelled us to moving forward. They were like, "Thank you for coming to us before you built it, so that you could get our feedback." And because we were able to get their feedback, they took it on as if they, they were a part of it. They felt ownership in what we were doing because we took the time to talk to them before we built it. A lot of times, if you're in the tech space, you build something and then you throw caution to the wind. Totally. We did it completely backwards. We, we decided to actually talk to the, the, the constituent parties and, you know, stakeholders and developed a relationship with them and got feedback so that when we knew when we built it, it would be something that would be legal. And that's the process that we went on. We met with, you know, state legislators, talked to them about it, got their feedback, and then we built our first pre-prototype uh, later on that year. Okay. And then we went through the process of uh, getting legislation done. Okay, so uh, just to step back a second, just so people understand the concept, what exactly is kind of revive or auto, and, and what are you guys exactly building? Okay. We, uh, Revive or Auto is the, you know, the company that has built the world's first digital electronic license plate. Okay. And initially, the thought process around having a digital electronic license plate, which we call the R-plate, uh, was uh, the ability to do over-air registration. Sure. But once we started peeling the onion back, we realized there was a million other things that you could do with that technology from, you know, doing over-air registration to doing, you know, Amber Alerts and, and doing unlimited uh, specialty plates and cause plates uh, to being able to sh show if a vehicle is stolen sure. and then doing th cool things like, you know, paying for tolls and parking through your license plate. Interesting. So it opened up a myriad of things that you could do from this technology. And then, then we started to realize that, you know, because you have real-time compliance, then you can, you know, you can have monthly payments instead of paying yearly. Uh, in California in particular, the uh, VLF fees, vehicle licensing fees, are going up sure. uh, by 25 to $175 per person. So the ability to be able to pay monthly it could be a huge deal for businesses and for consumers. Sure. So is the li license plate like Wi-Fi enabled or is there like a, a SIM card in there? Yeah, How does that it, work? Yeah, it, it, it's LTE enabled. It has an accelerometer, gyroscope. Uh, you know where you are. Uh, so, you, you know, you know where the vehicle is traveling. Uh, you know how it's being driven. Uh, you have the ability to do over-air registration. So, like I said, you don't need stickers or tags. Sure. We have an RFID chip that's within the plate, uh, which allows you to connect with um, with parking and tolling meters. So you, you have this, you know, this plate that allows you, this R plate that allows you to connect with the world around you. Interesting. So, so basically, you have the technology to know if I'm, well, not maybe, not physically maybe me, unless maybe like my phone Bluetooth to it or something, but... You could basically, where I'm getting at is you could basically know how much time somebody's in that car, right? So you could maybe even reach out to 
insurance and say, well, this person only drives 20 minutes a month or like 200 hours a month, whatever, right? And like maybe even charge them related to how how long they're actually in the car, right? And there's so many avenues you guys could explore. Wow. It's really it's really interesting that you brought that up. And that, that goes to a bigger point. I'm glad that you, you brought it up. So what's happening right now is that uh, when you go to fill up your tank, and if you're driving a car that's not electric, um, there's a gas tax that's associated with that. Okay. And the gas tax is supposed to pay for the infrastructure of the roads that you drive on every day. Right. But because CAFE standards continue to go up, and you have now electric vehicles on the road, those dollars are not going as far as they used to. Sure. So what's happening right now is states are trying to figure out how do you accurately charge somebody who may be an Uber driver or a Lyft driver or somebody who you know lives uh, you know two or three uh, two or three minutes away from you know where they work. So what's happening now is that they're you know all these states are trying to figure out like what is the right thing to do for vehicle miles traveled or road usage fee, and that's something that the plate can help enable because you know how much you're driving. So that information helps to show like you know what you should be charged. You sure. shouldn't be charged the same amount of money that you know a trucker who drives for a living is, is 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 charged. So there should be a way of equalizing that, and I think that that's something that this plate enables you to do because you have the mechanism to do that through the plate. Sure. But I want I want to back up and say something else sure. as well. It's really important to know that you know we're about we're pro privacy. Our big thing with our business is making sure that the people who use our product know how their data is being used or not used. Okay. Because I think there's been big issues with what's happened with Facebook. Yep. And, you know, I know internationally that Europe is really, you know, tied into, like, the usage of, of data and how it could be handled and, and, and the ability to port it out of a particular area. And all those things are important. And for us, it is, it, it's, it's really, really important that our users know that we protect and honor your information. Okay. And we we basically let folks know how it's being used or not used. And I, I it's just something that I thought it was important that I that no, I said totally. because it, yeah, yeah. I think people out there are feeling, you know, kind of raw because people feel like they haven't been communicated and that's not something that we do. We do the exact opposite. Sure. We're all about transparency. Well and to be hundred percent fair with you, like I have no idea what the DMV does with the information that they have about me, right? Like, I assume right. nothing <laughs> malicious, but, but I, but I, like, I think people have no idea, right? But at least if right. with you guys, like, you guys have a whole kind of software side that I, I don't right. know, is it a consumer side yet or is it just kind of on the business side right now? Okay, so how, how it's, it's structured right now is that our customers are, you know, dealerships. Mm -hmm. is our first, uh, you know, um, distribution channel. Okay. Uh, so we've got relationships with um, Galpin Motors, uh, Cooney, uh, Chevrolet and Cadillac, okay. uh, Pendragon Stores, Penske, uh, folks like that. And they use it in two ways. One way is uh, each dealership has their own fleet. And it's sure. for loaner vehicles and for parts vehicles. Gotcha. And then there's a, an F&I process, which is finance and insurance where they will actually sell the, uh, the you know, the plate as, you know, with the vehicle as, as an add-on. Okay. Uh, so that's one channel. We have uh, S&B, small to medium businesses that we work with that will utilize it, like folks like, you know, North Bay Landscaping or Morris Distributing or even uh, Kaiser Permanente, you, you would use that, uh, you know, within that, within that context. And then you have the third one, which is FNCs, which are fleet management companies. And you have, you know, folks like um, Lease Plan or Element or, you know, that have customers like um, AutoZone uh, or Comcast that would, would use a, a technology like ours. So we have those are the three, you know, distribution channels that we're using right now uh, for to getting the product out. Okay. And then what we're really going to be focused on is, um, is, you know, later on in the year, really focusing on consumer. But right now, it's, it's those three channels. Gotcha. But you can get to consumer through dealerships. Got gotcha. you. Okay. So, yeah, I guess where I was trying to go with that is, like, there's a software side of this that you could basically manage all this and see all the data that you know about while me or the plate that it's connected to. Absolutely. So, so how does that Absolutely. kind of work? 
So we, we basically have R Connect, uh, two products. We have the R Plate and R Connect. And R Connect is a portal that allows you to see how your plate is operating, also uh, get you connected to the DMV if you wanted to register your vehicle, or if you want to have a specialty plate or a cause plate or a sports plate, you, you have the ability to have that through you know, R Connect. Okay. So we're looking at it as a portal that enables you to be able to do things like, you know, you know, change your plate, you know, update your plate, uh, get a specialty plate, uh, the ability to pay for your parking and your tolling. You can do it through that process. Right. Uh, we have it on the web, and then we also will have an app. So, so how does it like? How does it exactly work? Do I have you have a bunch of like art art plates that haven't been set up, still in the box? Um, do I just pull one out and then? Can I activate it myself and get kind of a plate set up and ready to go and then just put it on the truck? Or do I still need to go into a physical DMV? No, no, no. You can do it all um, all through your portal. So okay. basically what happens is is that if you, say, get your plate at a, a dealership, uh, you would actually have that plate, um, you know, registered in the same way that you would do. Uh, we would uh, we would query the DMV to make sure the VIN number matched, okay. and then um, a plate number would be basically sent to your your plate, and that would be updated. Sure. And then you would be you know legal to drive and do whatever you would like with your plate. So within minutes, then, basically. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's it's a, it's a very seamless process. No, okay. I, I'm just trying to get the. It's like this is obviously not. There's no visuals, so I'm just trying to describe through audio like how this kind of works so like i'm looking at the site right now but walk us through how you describe kind of the plate because you have a california plate on your site and and you have you know you're showcasing that but it, it looks to me like you basically have the same information with the ability to kind of change the screen out or or make the numbers and and stuff or the numbers and letters smaller you know, to, to maybe, like you mentioned, um, uh, Amber Alert or something like that. But walk us through kind of what types of stuff you can showcase on the plate and how is it similar and different from like a, re a current plate? Okay. Uh, well, a, a current plate is a piece of, you know, stamp tin. And, and basically what you have is the image is, is what it is. Yeah. The difference with a digital plate is those formats you can change. So when the plate, when the when the uh, the vehicle is in motion, it's just a license plate because the, the first and foremost, what it needs to be is compliant, and it needs to be a license plate. Right. But when the vehicle is actually stopped, you have the ability to push, you know, targeted messaging to the plate. It has to be legally parked. Right. So I mean, you can use the plate as a parking meter. You know, when you get too close to, you know, if you're going to be parking, it indicates that you know you've connected and you paid. Okay. Uh, you can use it when you're driving through uh, a toll road because you, you can have uh, it's an RFID chip, so you're able to you know actually you know pay when you go through. It's part of the plate of itself. Okay. Uh, um, so you have the ability to change banners at the bottom, uh, you know, to say you know go Warriors or anything like that. Okay. So there's all these different things that you can you can physically do with the plate. You would have a library of information that you could choose from that you could push to the plate. But it's only when the plate is parked. It's not when it's in gotcha. motion. Got you. And then obviously you could so push. That, that... Oh, go ahead. Sorry. No, no, no. What are you going to say? I was just going to say. So you could base, but you could update like uh, all the plates across a fleet in a matter of seconds. Is that fair to say? Absolutely. That's, that's the reason why you would want it. So if you are a dealership or you're a fleet, fleet owner, you don't have to worry about having people go and physically change out stickers or tags or anything like that. You can remotely update your fleet, which is a huge benefit because the amount of time, energy that's wasted on menial tasks, you don't have to do anymore. Sure. You know, you can digitize and, and, and streamline your fleet that way. No, that... And then you'll know how you're... Oh, go, go ahead. ahead. Keep going. Sorry. And, and then you'll know how your vehicles are being driven and, you know, and, and, you know, and what issues may be coming up. The thing that's really nice about it is it's one platform that you're using. You're not having to go into another app or something else in order to pull data and information. You're able to see it in one failed swoop. I think that's the real benefit of having this technology is the platform, is, is, is our connect. You have the ability to do your parking, your tolling, 
uh, your registration, your messaging, all of that is on one platform. Sure. And that makes it easier for you to manage, you know, your business and, and what you're doing. No, 100% agree. The, the other thing I'm curious then, do you have enough technology or could you put enough technology in the plate to predict kind of maintenance for a fleet? Like if you're like this truck goes, I don't know, on gravel roads or up and down hills all day long that like it might need new tires sooner than kind of normal or it's probably ready for an oil change or like – just can you predict some kind of general kind of maintenance Absolutely. stuff? Absolutely. We, we, could, we could do all of those things because, again, we have GPS inside the vehicle. We have LTE connection. We know how far you're traveling. You know, we know, uh, you know, based on the data and information that you put in, you know, how many miles you need to go before an oil change or when tires should wear out, all of those things. You have the ability to do all of those things through through the platform. Okay, interesting. Yeah, like – that's where I think, not saying like the whole thing isn't interesting to begin with, but I think that's where it gets really interesting from like a cost savings, like preventative kind of stuff. Because especially in maybe states that, you know, get snow or it gets super cold, th like the last thing you want is to have to get a tow truck out in the middle of nowhere if you can prevent like, oh, this car might break down in the next few weeks because it needs oil or the tire or like, you know, right? Like... If you can kind of do preventative maintenance, you could potentially save a lot of time on top of all the other benefits. Absolutely, absolutely. And the thing that I think we're doing differently is we really engage uh, with the people that are, you know, are, are, are utilizing the product or interested in being a part of it. And we did that early on. Like we met before we built, as we were building it, we were meeting with fleet managers from all kinds of businesses and getting their feedback on things that they need and, you know, and, and, and looking at services that weren't actually providing that. And we built it based on the feedback that we were getting from people who actually used it every day. So it's like we were, we tried to be really thoughtful uh, and, and engage with people that have been in the business for a long time and, and have been around a lot of different products that work sometimes but don't work for their needs. Sure. And we wanted to build things that people want to utilize. And it's not just about having a million different things. It's about having things that actually affect your business. Sure. No, I 100% agree. So I want to dive a little bit into kind of the hardware itself of the plate. Like, how would you – how do you describe – it because it's like a, it's basically like a e-ink screen. Is that fair to say? Yeah. So you think about it like a candle okay. um, or candle light because uh, our our version, the R Plate Pro, it's um, it's it's actually connected to the vehicle. Okay. So uh, you know, in the evening, there's a light that illuminates the plate. Okay. Uh, so it's it it has a a backlight. Um, you also have, uh, like I said, an e-ink display. Uh, you've got protective glass in the front that's really robust, uh, and and then it's it's basically has you know like I said the accelerometer it has the brains of the actual plate and then it has a backing plate that that you tow into when you put it on the vehicle that helps to fasten it and keep it in place. Okay. So it's 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 a well built piece of technology. Um, I would it's IP66 rated for wind and water egress. Uh, it's uh, it will be, it will survive in temperatures from negative 40 to 85 C. Okay. Wow. Uh, so about 180 degrees, uh, and it's 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 really really ro robust, and we've tested it in a lot of different environments. Uh, we're really really excited about it. You know the way that it holds up and lasts. Sure. And then on top of it, it's, it's a beautiful piece of technology. <laughs> no, I, I think that's great. And then what are you guys using for software on the plate? Um, what do you mean? Like, are you, um, are as you, far as you got to be running some sort of software on the actual license plate. Like, is it Android? Is it like a version of Linux? Or what are you guys actually running on the plate? Yeah, it's a version of Linux. It's it's okay. not Android. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay, interesting. And then I'm assuming you guys could push, obviously, updates to the plate. Over the air, yeah, over the air activations. That's part of it. I mean, if you're going to be able to do registration, that's one of the things that you have to be able to do. Sure, interesting. Okay, so I'm curious to get into a little bit of the actual manufacturing process. You mentioned earlier, you guys obviously had to build a prototype, but I'm curious to know, like I know how. Well, I've never actually done it, but I've had people on the show that have talked about how 
tricky actually getting going from like even an, uh, a proof of concept to a physical, you know, first version of the product. But it, just for people, I'm curious to know how many kind of iterations or kind of prototypes did you need to actually do? And did you and how did you guys actually get this thing and kind of manufactured into having kind of the first version of this thing? Well, one of the things that, that we did early on is that we uh, we brought over um, the former uh, senior vice president of product for GoPro. Oh, wow. And, uh, yeah, so we um, were able to utilize him and his team. Uh, he was able to bring his team uh, with him. And um, so that's, that's how we built the new plate. Uh, initially, we used uh, LCD technology. Uh, because we had about, I would say, three iterations before he came on board. Okay. And then he kind of reworked the entire, you know, plate and was able to develop, you know, a, a product that was scalable. Uh, so we worked with WNC at a Taipei as a contract manufacturer. Okay. And then uh, we're also working with um, a group called NVD, New Vision Display, uh, that's out of Xinjiang, China. Okay. Uh, they've been, uh, you know, fantastic as a partner uh, sure. working with us. So did you make a few trips over to China or have you ever been? I'm just, I'm always fascinated to see if you well, actually went well, to the manufacturer. Yeah. <laughs> well, I haven't been, okay. but my uh, chief operating officer has been and, and, and my, you know, VPs of hardware, uh, they've all been there to make sure that the product is operating and working the way that it needs to. Uh, but I, I've, I haven't I haven't made a trip yet. I'm supposed to be actually going in the next couple of months. Okay, but I, I guess the point is, is like you had somebody from your team actually go there and you know at the plant oh, and kind of see. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely to oversee, make sure that you know quality control. We have um, you know quality control um, you know director that you know basically made sure that all the parts and everything worked the way they needed to and they were at the right quality. So yes, all of that was, sure. uh, you know, has been overseen, you know, because you know these guys have made, you know, millions of GoPros, and before totally. that, like Motorola phones and all the rest of that. So we have a really seasoned, uber smart group of individuals that understand hardware manufacturing. One of the really really big hires that we got as well was uh, Doug Mannix, who came from GoPro, who did all of their supply chain. Oh, so the deals that we were able to get with manufacturers were deals that a company uh, 50 times our size couldn't get. So we were really, really fortunate to be able to get some really, really quality people in early as we were building things out. Sure. No, I, I think it's great. So I, I know obviously you have a bunch of states that have kind of um, adopted off, adopted the plate. And you, you even mentioned early on in the show that you basically went to kind of the states first. And, and so you've done a really good job at kind of leveraging the, the public-private partnership so how did you kind of go about kind of bridging that I, I know you had some connections that made some introductions but it's a lot more complicated than just you know you know having a quick meeting with somebody right so how how do you kind of do that because I think very few people are successful at actually kind of bridging you know the public private partnership or they give up before they they succeed at it yeah no you, you know something that's a that's that's an extremely valid point that I think most people don't get if you really believe in something, then you've got to, you know, kind of stick the course and, and continue to work. And, and that's what I did. I believed in what, what I was doing and what the company was about. And I just developed relationships and it didn't happen overnight. Sure. I incorporated the company in 2009. Okay. So it took, you know, years of working, talking, uh, partnering in order for us to get where we, where we did. And I invested the money. I mean, I had to invest money and time in order for it to work. Sure. Most companies would not do that because, you know, they're looking for a return right away. But there was a vision to say, like, if we did this, this could be really huge. And, you know, it's the, it's the right way to develop a partnership because we have to bring value to the partner that we're working with and vice versa. Sure. And I believe that I really spent time thinking about that and studying and going to committee meetings and, and, and talking to state legislators and working with the DMV and working with the CHP and working with the Department of Transportation. And that was all part of the process, law enforcement. And, and, and it was just a continual process of, of being there, you know, explaining what we're trying to do, working with them to help fix problems that were available. 
And now it's a relationship that's really symbiotic. It's like if there's an issue that comes up, they have no problem calling me sure. and saying, hey, I've got this issue. Can you help, you know, you know, develop a fix for it? And it's, it, and it's, and it's back and forth. So it's, it's the right kind of thing. And I think most people don't realize or think that state agencies and, you know, bureaucrats are smart. Uh, but they are, and they and they really care about their constituents, and they really care about what they're doing. And if you help them and work with them, then there's positive things that can come from that. And I'm just a huge proponent, and very thankful uh, for the folks that you know worked with me and um, and allowed me to help build this this business. Sure. No, I I think that's really good advice, right? Because, and, and you mentioned it earlier, but I think it's worth stating again that like they felt like they were basically building the plate with you guys instead of you just yeah. trying to like cram it down their throats saying you need this you need this you need this buy this buy this right like they felt very much like they were a part of it basically before it was kind of a, a real physical thing and so that obviously makes it a lot easier. And then if you have these ongoing relationships with them where they feel like they can call you if a little issue comes up, I think that's really good advice for people out there that are looking to do something where, you know, it's kind of state or kind of nation or even kind of global changing, right? Absolutely. I mean, it only works if you're willing to work. Sure. And it Fair. only works if you're willing to listen. And that's, I think, another thing too. It's like if somebody's telling you something, listen to what they're saying. They're saying it for a reason. And, and I think that I've, I pride myself on, you know, I have one mouth and two ears. I listen twice as much as I talk. And it's important for you to be able to do that and, 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 and really hear why they're saying it, because there's a reason. And, and, and then in addition to that, it's, it, it, was, it was a process that was really fun because they helped to be a part from the beginning and then there's a, an appreciation because I want no credit for anything that's done. I'm just looking for freedom to operate. Interesting. All the credit goes to them because I, the only thing that I'm wanting is the ability to, you know, have my place as an option, okay. not something that's mandated, but something that's an option because I believe that if I build the right type of product that you'll want it. Sure. And I don't, I don't, I don't want to feel like, oh, somebody is forcing somebody to get this product and that's good for my business model. No, it's completely the opposite. I need to build something that has value that brings people to it. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, that's fair. It's kind of a, a little bit of the Apple model, right? Like you don't need, uh, a, you don't even need a smartphone to be honest with you, right? Like, well, you can right. maybe even argue right. you don't even need a phone, but let's say, you, you know, I think majority of people would say they need a phone, but I, I think you don't need the top of the line smartphone, but people buy it. And obviously Apple's one of the most valuable companies ever. So it's working, right? So I understand that. That makes right. a lot of sense, right? Like if you build a really good product, people are going to buy it. Yeah, it's interesting. So yeah. you obviously got this in a bunch of states and you have some international kind of interest. How does, how did you kind of go about from getting kind of states finally on board and then moving to other states? Because Obviously, yeah, you were talking to people in California, but, you know, how did you start getting it into other states and then kind of beyond? So early on, one of my uh, advisors uh, was the, uh, you know, past president of ANVIL, which is the Automobile Administrator for the U.S. and Canada. Okay, And nice. they basically set the standard for all the MVs. So I uh, worked with him and, um, and was able to get, you know, access to a lot of the MV directors across the country. And once I did that and started going to their events, I started building relationships. And uh, we, there was a, the Amber International Conference in San Francisco last year, and we had uh, a big booth there. So we had 42 states and territories come by our booth. Oh, wow. And from there on, things have just taken off. So we're, we're, you know, we're in California and, and Arizona. Okay. We passed legislation in Texas and uh, Florida, and we'll be in those two states uh, later on this year. Congrats, man, that's both great. Quarter. And, and then we'll have another nine states that we'll be doing a pilot or something else in before the end of the year. Oh, and right. that state, like, you know, uh, like we're, we're, we're talking to Oregon and we're talking to Colorado and, and Georgia and Washington and Maryland and uh, Pennsylvania and um, 
in, in, in Michigan and Illinois. And I mean, and, and we have all of these states like coming to us wanting to be involved in what we're doing in, in Nevada. You know, I'll be, we'll be in Nevada next week. So nice. it's, it's, it's a situation where things are beginning to grow upon one another. And, you know, we have a solution that helps them solve problems that they haven't been able to fix. So it's, it's, it's a good situation because it's not building just an app that is cute to have or nice to have, but you're actually building a product that solves real problems. Yeah. Well, and you're saving money, right? For the state right. and for exactly. business and potential exactly. and the consumer when it's actually released. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. No, that, that's really cool. So you, you kind of mentioned to me before we, we got started, you, you're, you're also kind of moving outside of North America, which is super exciting. Uh, do you want to maybe talk about that? Absolutely. The, man, it's, it's so interesting. So we, um, after we had made an announcement about a fundraise uh, back in, uh, the, you know, November time frame, I believe. Okay. Uh, we started getting inundated with folks from other countries like, you know, Sweden and I- Indonesia and Malaysia and, and Singapore and South Africa and, and Brazil and, um, and Dubai and, and Qatar and all these different places, you know, and, you know, uh, Canada, you know, we, we, we started getting inundated back and forth and we reached out, you know, Dubai, some folks from Dubai reached out. Uh, we started a dialogue, you know, that took about a month, month and a half when my uh, chief operating officer was heading to um, China uh, to, uh, to, to check on the product and then heading over to Taipei he stopped off in Dubai and met with uh, uh, RTA, okay. uh, the Roads and Transportation Authority for Dubai, and uh, our partner down there, uh, Team Target. Uh, so, you know, three weeks later, uh, after that meeting, uh, we have a, a POC, a proof of concept, that we signed with, with RTA. Right. And um, it sent out a, a press release a couple weeks ago. And uh, we have, you know, kind of a plan built out to, you know, to, to, to prove out the technology there and then to roll out product, uh, hopefully at some point next year. That's awesome, man. Congrats. That's huge. Yeah, no, it's, it's really big because, you know, it's interesting. Dubai is doing it right. When, when I hear conversations around, you know, um, autonomous vehicles and everything else, I hear it, but it doesn't really resonate here okay. for one reason. Nobody's spending money on infrastructure. Sure. There are so many things that need to be changed in order for those vehicles to be supported by these roads. Sure. If you look at our roads, I mean, they're, they're not in the best shape. Sure. And if, if, these, if, 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 if these autonomous vehicles are supposed to be able to read and understand different scenarios and circumstances, you've got to actually build infrastructure that actually responds back to it. Sure. So yeah. I mean, when I when I hear when I hear about like you know autonomous vehicles, and it all sounds good, and people are putting a ton of money into it, I would say the person that's really going to win is the people that put money into infrastructure, because somebody something's got to support what it is that you're trying to build, and I I don't see how you can do one without the other, and what yeah. what Dubai's doing, yeah, what Dubai's doing that's different is that they're pumping tons of money into their infrastructure, so they're building smart cities. So, you know, you're, it's either going to be DSRC or it's going to be 5G technology. I'm not sure which one's going to win out sure. uh, as far as the connectivity platform. And you, you, you've got to have V2V, vehicle-to-vehicle, and vehicle-to-infrastructure communication going on to really have a smart city and really enable and support autonomous vehicles. Yeah. Until we're really doing that and spending that money, then it's, it's, it's a nice thought. Yeah, it's, it's a novelty, right? It having, yeah. It, it, yeah, it's a novelty. Yeah, that's interesting because I, I've done I, – I, I test drove a Tesla number a couple of years ago and like I tried the the auto the autopilot uh, mode. And it was interesting. It took a few I, – I felt more comfortable like, you know, faster than I thought. But I, I know other people that said they've tried it in other cities where kind of lanes kind of just merge together and like the car just freaks out a little bit. Like you can't have that stuff or, you know, there's been a bunch of stuff in the news lately where – you know, sadly, people have actually died in, in that mode, you know, or got killed by, a, you know, autonomous vehicles. So we're, we're clearly nowhere near that yet. Right. And 
I know there's a whole huge debate, and I don't really want to go down the political side, but you're, to your point, like, I think it just strengthens your right. Like, you need to build everything around the car just as much as you need to build into the car, right? Right. You've got to have a support infrastructure that is going to be able to communicate with the vehicle that you know, as smart as the vehicle is. I mean, in order for you to really feel secure that you have a system that's going to work long term. Sure. Because there are going to be so many scenarios that come up based on where the infrastructure is now that the car is not going to be able to react to. And what it's going to do is it's probably going to just seize up yeah. or make a decision that, you know, you wouldn't make as a driver because you understand variations that happen within environments and, and, and on roads. So, it's it's a it's a scary thing for me, sure. um, and I can understand like you know why there's apprehension within states because you know what happens if something happens? Yeah. What how do you deal with that? And how can you even talk about mass deployment without really talking seriously about a huge infrastructure play that helps to build up our infrastructure so that it can support that? Sure. And then the other two issue is like weather conditions, right? Like snow and ice is right. way different driving on than. You know, just a nice, <laughs> nice sunny day in California. <laughs> absolutely, man. Absolutely. And, and and how do you deal when you don't see the lines on the road? Yeah. I mean, I yeah, mean, no, because totally. it's like if, when you start thinking about all of those things and, you know, and all of those, you know, touch points that have to be in place in order for the car to feel comfortable in that space. I just I just think that we're far off no, because I haven't heard anybody say anything about making a huge infrastructure play to be able to support where we believe, you know, vehicles are going. And I mean, if you start looking at that, you know, from, you know, the government is who invested in computers initially in order to open up, you know, the internet and, 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 and the ability to build computers. And, you know, even when it came to fueling, I mean, the investment that went into that for people to actually start, you know, uh, being able to get, you know, petrol. And then, and then you start talking about like solar, you know, yeah. there has to be an investment in order for people, for the people in the private sector to be able to feel like they could put their money into something that they're not going to lose because businesses are in business to make money. Totally. So if, if, if they know that they're going to be able to get, you know, you know, some sort of write off or there's, it's, it's discounted in some way, they're not going to you know, spend the time or the energy or resources to invest in a particular area. So when I start seeing, you know, something you know, from states or from the federal government that says this is where we're going and we're putting together these large grants or we're giving huge tax breaks in order for you to spend money in these particular areas, then at that point I'll say, okay, that's the direction we're going in. Until sure. I see that, it's just, it's just, you know, it's just great talk. Yeah. No, I 100% agree with you. So I, I think it's a good segue. You, you said you've been doing this since 2009. How did yes. you guys kind of fund this? Did you self-fund? Did you raise some money? I, I know you guys are looking to raise some more money. Like, what? Walk us through that kind of journey. Okay, so um, so what we did is from 2009 to 2016, okay. we raised convertible debt. So it was friends and family and high net worth individuals that believed in the concept and idea that we were able to put together about five and a half million dollars of convertible debt. Wow, congrats, man, in that's great. January, thanks, man. In, in January of 2017, we raised our first institutional fund, which was a series seed. Okay. Not C, but seed. And we oh. raised uh, $7.5 million. Wow. And then in congrats, August, that's great. August of the same year, uh, we raised a series A. And uh, we ended up raising a total of uh, $12.5 million wow, in, in a Series A. So um, what we're going to be going out and doing here, you know, shortly is raising a Series B. Okay. Uh, and um, we've got a lot of interest uh, in the Series B because we're going to use that to really be able to scale out the business, sure. uh, both domestic opportunities and international opportunities. Yeah, no, I, I think that's great. So if there's anybody listening that wants to maybe invest in it, like, do you, does it have to be in North America? Does it, where are you guys kind of looking? And oh, it, this is a funny thing. Um, one of my largest investors uh, is in Canada. Okay, interesting. I've got, uh, it, our, our largest investor is actually out of Australia. Oh, wow. So I've got, you know, several investments out of Australia, uh, Canada, and then, of course, the U.S. 
Okay. So I, I I didn't do the traditional, you know, Sand Hill uh, Road, uh, sure. you know, march. Uh, I, I realized that there's money in other places, and a lot of times, you know, other places, other countries don't get the same opportunities that we get here in the Valley. Sure. So I, I was uh, very keen on, on breaking the mold and going other places to be able to get funds, and it's actually really worked out. And we have a very diverse uh, group of investors and, you know, and and with that, you know, board members. Sure. Well, and then it also helps you get into those countries you see here, right? Fair enough? Absolutely. 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 So I, I'm curious. Um, well, I, I'm Canadian. I actually live in Canada. Um, how did you go about finding kind of investors in Canada and Australia? Because well, obviously Canada is not that far from the valley. It's a few hour flight, depending on where you go in, in Canada. But how did you find somebody in Australia? Because that's, you know, like a day flight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, for real. Man. It's like it's like fifteen hours. So, so what happened was is that uh, my um, EVP of strategic partnerships is Australian, oh, okay. a gentleman named Alan Cooper. Yeah, so he put me in touch with several people. Like he put me in touch with uh, Stephen Polk uh, from RL Polk, uh, who's an investor. He put me in touch with Ernst Lee, okay, who's uh, the former CEO and president of Mercedes Benz in Canada, Australia, and the U.S. Oh, uh, cool. He also put me in touch with Simon Sheva, who is the managing director of the ACK group in Legats, and he actually helped lead our round, oh, okay. uh, you know, both rounds that we raised. So that's the Australian connection there. And okay. then we, you know, we had people like John Thompson, uh, who is uh, the chairman of Microsoft that has been very instrumental and then now we have Ken Denman, who's our chairman of the board, uh, that his company, he sold to Emotion that did facial recognition technology. Oh, wow. Uh, and and uh, he's on the board of Costco and Motorola and Lending Club and just a bunch of other companies. Wow. But he's, like, fantastic. And then we had folks like, you know, uh, Nick Brathwaite from, uh, you know, Walden Riverwood Ventures and, you know, from Flextronics. Uh, he used to be the former CTO, so we were we were very fortunate uh, to get a really diverse and really smart group of individuals that one invested in the company, but two, uh, you know, are part of our board. Uh, so we've been we've been really really fortunate that way. I, I would say our board is as good as any Fortune 500 company. Oh yeah, you got they're huge kind of names and and companies. So for people like, how did you get such kind of big names and and people on your board? You know, it's a funny thing. If you believe that you can get access, then you create the access. Sure. And, and what I mean by that, yeah, no, and, and what I mean by that is that, I mean, with like John Thompson, for instance, uh, I'm part of Silicon Valley Leadership Group, and it's a, you know, kind of a public advocacy group. Okay. And he was being awarded uh, something, and he was, you know, he was being awarded a Lifetime Achievement Award. Wow. And um, I heard him speak, and after he spoke, I, you know, I asked him, I was like, hey, I'm very impressed, you know, by everything you were able to do. It was like, I've got this, you know, company that I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm building out. You know, I'd love your opinion on it. And the thing that I've always been impressed with him is that I, he gave me his email address. I emailed him the next day. He got okay. back to me within an hour. Wow. He is a person that makes time for people. That is just an amazing trait of, uh, I think, highly successful people. Sure. Is that if they, if they give you something, they actually really mean it. Yeah. And, uh, and, and, and he introduced me to a lot of people uh, like Ken Denman, who's on my board, uh, Michael Marks, uh, and that's how I met Nick Brathwaite from WRB. Right. Michael Marks used to be the CEO of Flextronics. He was also uh, the CEO of Tesla for a while. Uh, you know, he has a, a huge company that, you know, just got, you know, several hundred million dollars. Uh, I think, you know, Qatar, I mean, he's, he's doing so many interesting things. Uh, so, but I got, I, all, I was connected um, through John Thompson. He helped to get me connected with all these different people. Sure. And from there, I just developed relationships with them individually. And I've been able to use that to build out the company. Yeah, it just kind of snowballs, right? Like you just need one person and you need, yeah, you need yeah. one one yeah. crack in the yeah. dam for, totally. for it to break. No, I, I think that's really good advice because I, I think sometimes people think that some of these people are 
so like untouchable, right? But I think, I think inaccessible, and it's it's not true because yeah. the whole thing is, is they're, they're a person like you. They put their pants on one leg at a time, yeah. and, and they tie their shoes, you know. And it's and it's a situation where if you ask, you know, all they can say is yes or no. Totally, and, you know, it's 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 it's, it's pretty binary that way. Yeah, and I I also think too that a lot of successful people are willing to help other people that they believe in because somebody helped them. Exactly. Or many exactly. people help them, right? It's probably that's probably a better statement. But yeah, so I I think like even just personally I I can kind of almost say the same thing. There's people that I've reached out to that I was like there there's absolutely no way I will hear back from this person and then I've had it where it's taken, you know, 20 minutes or I've had it where it's taken maybe even two weeks or something, but they write back and if it's take two weeks, they like apologize and you're like, really? Like, I'm, I'm just shocked that you even wrote back to me. You don't have to apologize, but, but, but I think that's great, man. So no, I, I've been very fortunate in that way. I mean, it's just that I've, I've, you well, know, you put yourself out there though, that, right? I just, yeah, absolutely. I think that's the biggest thing is that if you don't show up, you'll never know. Totally. So anytime I have, you know, an investor or an advisor say you need to be someplace, I'm always there because you never know who you're going to meet, you know, what relationship you're going to develop that over time can help benefit both of you. Totally. So for me, it's just like, I'm always, if somebody tells me I need to be there, I'm there. Totally. And it doesn't matter if I'm dog tired or what's happening. You've got to show up. 90% of life is just showing up. Yeah. hundred percent agree, man. I, I think that's great. But but sadly we're we're out of time. So let's close the show with mentioning where people can get more information about you guys. Go to www.rplate.com. Rplate.com. Uh, or go to www.reviverauto.com and reviver spelled the same way forward and backwards just to make sure you have it right. Oh, okay. But yeah, you, yeah, you go go to our website and uh, you'll know and find out everything about us, the states that we're coming into, uh, where our plates are available. Like I said, we're selling them at, you know, Galpin Motors, at uh, Cooney Chevrolet and Cadillac. Uh, we're also at Pendragon Stores, um, you know, Hornburg. Um, we're, and then, you know, we also have, we'll have them in Penske Stores as well. But we're, we're really, really, really excited, uh, you know, about, you know, one, you, you making the time, you know, to talk to me today, but the opportunity that's out here to have a product that I think really brings value. No, man. Well, I appreciate that. And, you know, I really appreciate you taking the time out of your day to be on the show. And I look forward to keeping in touch with you and have a good rest of your day, man. Yeah, you the same. You the same. Thank you so much. Thanks. Bye. Okay, bye-bye. Thanks for listening. Please visit the show's website at buildingthefutureshow.com. Also check us out on Facebook at Building the Future Show and follow us on Twitter at Building Show. The music for the show is done by Electric Mantra. You can check him out at electricmantra.com and keep building the future.